Thank you everyone for attending this morning's webinar. My name's John Baird. Um, I'm with a research agronomist with New South Wales DPI and also at Cotton Nutrition Lead with Cotton Info, which is supported by CRDC. So this morning we're, we're going to be talking, um, and, and it's a quite an informal webinar in regards to managing your nitrogen, especially in cotton systems and the wet season that we've had. So we've got some relevant research to show you, plus um, there will also be some data that Chris Dowling from Back Paddock can present as a as an up-to-date guide, I guess, for a lot of uh, fields in, coming into this season. So there's three talkers, myself, um, I'll kick it off, and then we have Dr. Graham Swinky from New South Wales DPI, a soil scientist, and also Dr. Chris Dowling from the Back Paddock Company. And as I said, supported by Cotton Info and Cotton Research and Development Corporation. Now, we'll take this time to promote two other Cotton Info um, days. Uh, we have a, a two nutrition field days, which Graeme and Chris will be a part of as well. Um, the first one being located at St George um, at Farm 185, and, and that's on the 22nd of November, Tuesday the 22nd of November, starting at 9 o'clock. So for more inf information, a lot of more information will be uh, sent out in the coming week, um, but Andrew McKay, the Cotton Info REO, uh, will be the person to RSVP with. Also, the second uh, nutrition field day is planned for Collie Amberley, um, and that nutrition field day will be on the 1st of December, Thursday is the 1st of December, at the Collie Amberley Hall, I believe. Um, but more information, again, will be sent out with Kieran O'Keefe in the next coming week. Um, it has been a bit of a different year. It's been quite wet and now we're starting to see some storms, peri periodic storms and a lot of flooding. My, my hometown's been isolated five times in the last six weeks. So yeah, it's a great time of the year at the moment. Anyway, so we'll kick it off with my presentation on um, moisture induced changes in soil nitrogen supply and implications for crop management. So looking into the future, into the crop as well. Graeme Swanky from New South Wales DPI will present um, on the opportunity to use modified um, products and controlled release products, enhanced fertilisers, when, where and why. And Chris Dowling from Back Paddock Corporate uh, Company, he's got some live data from this year, so he'll, it'll be a good guide on what's, what he's seen from his clients in this coming season or in this past winter and spring, um, and then also a good guide on how do we use plant tissues um, to guide nitrogen decisions in season? Okay, so I'll kick it off. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is, is the water influence on soil nitrogen and the supply of that soil nitrogen um, and how that's going to implicate uh, for the crop nitrogen uptake and management and some, some very quick guides on, on how to, to ensure optimum um, nitrogen use. So to start with, I want to go back to the, the nitrogen cycling. And, and this picture, it's quite detailed, but it's a great descriptive uh, figure of our nitrogen cycle in a cotton system. Um, and, and I'm talking irrigation systems when I, I, I say a cotton system. So as you can see, we have um, with the fertilisers. You know, we, we apply fertilisers to fill the gap from the soil nitrogen to fill the, that need of, the, of our crops. Um, to produce as optimum yield. So our fertilisers are applied in a number of different methods. Um, and when they're applied, our soils quickly cycle those around to ammonium and nitrate. Now, typically our cotton soils are high in clay concentrations. They're slightly alkaline. And as a result, they will prefer to cycle towards the nitrate. Um, so a lot of our soils, when we apply fertiliser, or even if they are enriched naturally, um, they uh, do have a higher concentration of nitrate than ammonium. And, and that's just typical of our alkaline clay soils. Now, some will also go to organic nitrogen, which is a lot more stable and uh, may will still be in our soil structure, but will be um, available later from, from future crop needs. 
Now, the thing is, with when our nitrogen is in the nitrate stage or form, um, it, it does, it's highly soluble and it will move quite quickly um, in our soil profile, especially with the influence of water. Um, and there's three major lost pathways um, from a cotton system. First one is leaching, um, not a big part lost pathway from our um, cotton systems, but it does leach. Um, and I think Chris has got some really good data to show that leaching through a cotton soil um, over time. The second one, um, and this is by far our greatest lost pathway, um, and that is atmospheric losses. So volatilisation and denitrification. Volatilisation um, usually occurs straight after application of the fertiliser and a big miss is, is when we apply on our surface um, and then it evaporates before it's actually made contact or actually absorbed by our clay soils. Denitrification is the, probably the biggest, um, well it is the biggest loss of nitrate, um, it's probably our biggest loss in our whole system. And basically that occurs when our soil becomes saturated, um, water logging, unfortunately high rainfall, um, saturated soils, and this is a, with high soil temperatures and an enriched environment, uh, together those factors um, really lead to high denitrification losses. And basically 30 to 40% of our nitrogen fertiliser, and this is from data from using 15N, which is a, a stable isotope, a, a um, tracing mechanism. 30 to 40% of our nitrogen fertilizer, its fate, I shouldn't say loss there, but it, its fate is usually um, in atmospheric losses. I will jump on, I will talk a little bit more about denitrification and, and the relationship with soil saturation in a minute. Now, lastly, runoff. Um, now this is a, is a, it's a smaller loss, but it is still quite significant. And we've found using 15N again that 10, approximately 10 10% 10 of nitrogen fertilizer, the fate um, usually occurs in runoff, can occur with runoff. And that's highly dependent on your irrigation system um, and the efficiency of your system. Now, um, of course, you can use that on your next field if you recycle that very quickly. But if it's to stay in your water or water source um, for a longer period of time, um, that loss will be, again, lost to the environment. Okay, so that's a quick rundown on the nitrogen cycle in a cotton system, in an irrigated cotton system. So how's that related to this year? So let's think about what's happened this year. Um, firstly, uh, you know, during the win uh, winter and early spring from last season, we had cooler temperatures and consistent rainfall. Um, what that meant is that our soil has remained or has had high soil moisture throughout those winter months. Now, just lately, that rain has increased in intensity um, and storms during the late spring, early summer. And in the in the Nemoy Valley, for instance, we're receiving flood after flood from these isolated storms. Um, and then rain intensity really has increased quite a lot. So this is a picture um, that I've taken in the local area just uh, this week. And it, I think it's quite adamant, uh, you know, that this cotton was planted on rain moisture. Um, it's came up okay, but you can see that the, the new first tree leaf is a little bit light in colour. Um, and, and that soil profile is completely saturated. So that's a mixture of having an anaerobic soil um, where there is a lack of oxygen and also being uh, cloudy weather. So that's something that's pretty common at the moment in this local area. Uh, and I just want to say, going back to that, um, there's not a lot we can do right now. And the best thing we can do is allow oxygen back into our soil profile, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Now, I spoke about denitrification and a relationship with soil saturation. So this is a good chart. Um, it's not based on our uh, vertisols. Uh, it's actually got a soil with a little bit less clay content um, and it's got it's quite acidic soil pH as well. But it's a great chart to show the relationship between soil moisture um, and microbial activity and denitrification. So as you can see, um, 
a, a, a low to moderate amount of soil moisture is the ideal time for mineralisation, and which peaks around that 60% of water filled plot space. But as, you, as soil saturation increases, and once we hit 80% soil saturation, and it increases up to 100%, that's the period where we start to see high denitrification. And that's what that's our greatest risk in vertisols because we such it's a soil that holds so much water. Um, we can definitely um, we have a number of scenarios where denitrification does occur, potentially could occur. Now this is a, a good chart from the um, from the Nutrilogic uh, book uh, on the Scott and Info website. Now this shows the relationship between nitrogen fertiliser and the percentage applied and the date. So here we have uh, nitrogen applied, fertiliser applied in January, the summer before planting, March, May and June. And you can see the losses. So this is the percentage of loss of that fertiliser come planting date, which was in October. Um, a very similar year, or, or rain, it was above average rainfall in 1992, similar to this year probably not quite as high as this year, but you can see the relationship. So there was a high potential for losses of nitrogen fertiliser the earlier that we apply. It's a, it's a chart that you may have seen before, and, it, and it's a great description chart of, to show you that the potential of that fertiliser loss over the, the season in the, in the application date. So what can we do after the wet start to the season? As I said earlier, the best thing we need to get oxygen back into our soil. We need that soil to dry. Um, having a saturated soil is going to decrease the uptake of our plants of nitrogen, potassium and iron especially. Um, foliar fertilisers can help, but probably not just yet, mate, more so later, especially if we have received more um, events that prolong soil saturation. And those foliars, uh, are only just a, a, a stock gap. They're, they're not going to have that long lasting effect or benefit. So they're really just to get the plant through a, um, a stressful event. Now, the last thing, it's probably the hardest, but please don't enter the field when it is saturated, the compaction and the possible destruction of the plant hill and the damage to the roots um, may have a far greater and longer impact on, on your cropping system than having um, Water log plants. Just quickly, or just a quick reminder on the on the typical uptake of nitrogen uh, cotton nitrogen by cotton plants or crop, crops over the season. Um, now, this is from my PhD study. Now, as you can see, the uptake is a sigmoidal uh, curve, and the with the most or sixty percent of that nitrogen occurring between first square and early flower. So that's our key period. That's the period that we need our nitrogen in our system and available for the crop, okay? I, yeah, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on where it moves or how it's been used, but that's the key period for our nitrogen management. Get it in, get it available, and have the plant have sufficient amount of nitrogen for this period. Please, but don't forget, and I know there's gonna be times or we're starting to, to think about how we do get our nitrogen on, Continue to follow the four R's, the right product, the right time, the right method, and the right rate. This last chart is from a, a trial I ran last year in my PhD. Now, this is looking at nitrogen in crop against a pre-plant um, applied nitrogen. What it's done is it actually promoted veg vegetative growth. So applying too much nitrogen too late in the season has provoked, promoted vegetative crop, it's actually reduced yield. This chart is, is plant height, um, but it's also increased biomass, leaf matter. And what's that meant? Well, it's really it impacted defoliation, made it a lot trickier, and also um, it was costly in the sense that fibre quality decreased. Um, and that's something that we've seen recently with Renee's work down in, in the south that if you have excessive nitrogen in the system, too late in the system, there is a high potential now to, to cause economic damage and, and have an economic loss due to fibre quality. So be mindful of your, your timing and ensure that that nitrogen isn't in surplus too late in the season.
Okay, thank you. So I'll stop sharing mine. Um, what we'll do, Warwick, is, is keep our questions till the end, or is there anything quickly? We've got about a minute if there's a question. So, John, there is one in here um, <clears throat> that at some stage uh, they'd like to know how will crops um, that have been planted late and now just one to two leaves um, have their nutrition program measured and managed? And that's from the south, uh, from Griffith area. Okay. Um, we might leave that with Chris because we'll, we'll tackle that together. But that's a really good question. And as I said, in this is the, going to be the key for the south. Is we, you know, we've got to get the nitrogen in. <laughs> it's going to be hot, really difficult. We may have to look at other means rather than, you know, being on the field and more like water run possibly. We've got to get that nitrogen in during this key period of first square to early flowers. Um, and this last point of having excessive nitrogen late in the season, this is a big worry for the south. We, we've got to ensure that there's not too much um, enrichment late in the season so we can pull that crop off and defoliate um, on time. So, yeah, it, but they may just have to look at other means rather than the bulk granular. If the wet, if the um, soil's too saturated, too wet to, to put a rig in, um, we ha may have to look at the, the secondary products like water run to get that nitrogen into the system. But I, I think we'll tackle that together as well with Chris at the end. So I'll stop sharing um, and I'll pass it over to Graeme Swanky. I've been asked to talk this morning for a few minutes about uh, some of the opportunities that might be out there for using modified uh, products and what, where, when and why. So I'll try and make it fairly quick. So first of all, just another reminder that really all the four R's reply, uh, apply. So right product matching the nutrient source to the crop's need, the right rate, it's pretty important. Um, getting the right rate for the, what the crop needs, right timing. That's, as John's just saying, timing's pretty crucial and therefore getting it to where the crop needs it, it's gonna be also a case of the right putting in the right place. So why uh, are we uh, talking about these modified products and well, what, what can they do? Well, I guess two of the key things that we're looking at are one, preventing uh, nitrogen losses, uh, both agronomic losses um, that are gonna impact on your yield potential and environmental losses that, uh, you know, things that happen off farm, but are still quite important. And I guess the other main category of why we might be using these is really where, you know, the focus in some more, we're, we're trying to match the nitrogen supply with the crop's demand. As John said, um, trying to get it there when the crop needs it and not sort of later on. And a lot of these products are based around slow or delayed release mechanisms, but but not all. And yeah, when's really the best time to, to put it in and, and when will really depend on what we're talking about. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, volatilization. So John mentioned this is one of the processes uh, in soil um, that affects or can potentially be a, a reasonable size loss of of product that you put in. Uh, in this diagram, I've just got urea here, but um, other ammonium fertilizers have just popped up there. So including anhydrous ammonia and, and, and other products with ammonium or ammonium forming um, nitrogen in them. I guess in terms of the volatilization, a urease inhibitor is is one of these modified products. So uh, a urea with a coating of a urease inhibitor can stop this hydrolysis process from producing ammonium. So you apply your urea, but it, re it remains in the form of urea uh, where you've put it for a period of time. So it's not uh, not a permanent thing, it's a, it's a temporary thing to basically give you some time for uh, the right conditions to, to come along and the right conditions being rainfall generally. So you want to get that urea dissolved and into good contact with the soil where um, it's less liable to loss via this mechanism. So when it's in the ammonium form and it's in the soil, the potential for this type of loss is lower and then all these other processes then take the ammonium 
onwards, I suppose. So particularly nitrification and plant uptake. So plants can take up ammonium, but all the microbial uh, communities in the soil will convert through nitrification through to a more, let's say, more stable form of nitrate in the soil. So that's one product we can look at. And these are, I guess, the, the key facts that um, I was just talking about. It's it's temporary, maybe a couple of weeks, two weeks-ish. Uh, it depends on you know, some of the weather conditions and, and the, the strength of the inhibitor that you put through with it. Um, but it just also, uh, I like to mention that ammonia does have environmental off-site off effects. So when the ammonia volatilizes, it goes into the atmosphere, it's deposited again somewhere else. So it may be the next paddock or it may be a fair way away, but um, that can have uh, impacts, not only uh, agronomic on some other uh, crop or, or ecosystem, but um, in, in extreme examples, it can affect human health as well. And it's, it's responsible for some major pollution issues overseas, particularly. Um, and I guess the thing, key thing with urease inhibitors is does the extra cost justify the use of it uh, in, the, in that situation? If you're going to put urea out and you follow it up with an irrigation, then it's, it's really um, not needed because you're getting that washing in effect anyway. So that's that one. Uh, the next process we're looking at is uh, nitrification inhibitor. So we're looking at these other uh, well, the loss process, the main loss process, as John mentioned, uh, in clay soils particularly is denitrification. But nitrification inhibitors also act on uh, preventing leaching as well. Uh, and I've got in brackets here, and nitrification, because it's basically stopping the nitrification process for a period of time. Again, uh, once again, it's not permanent. Uh, it stops it for a period of time. Um, and both these processes, denitrification and nitrification have environmental uh, offsite effects as well. And the main one being the, the emission of greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. As you can see through this the, the diagram here, the, the different uh, puffs of smoke coming up out of the nitrate as it denitrifies, starts as nitric oxide, nitrous oxide and dinitrogen. So any of these can come out of the soil as emissions. Uh, but the one we're most concerned about is nitrous oxide in environmental terms, um, but in, in agronomic terms, the biggest loss in this process is dinitrogen N2. So it's, you might say, well, it's harmless, and it's just going back into what some uh, major constituent of the atmosphere anyway, but it a, represents a, uh, an, a wholesale loss of you know, some fertilizer that you've put in and an expense that you've made. So it's, it's basically, yeah, slowing this process down keeping it in the ammonium form in the soil where it's um, relatively safe from um, this potential for denitrification. So as I've said these inhibitors can prevent the loss from nitrate denitrification and leaching so if it's not in the nitrate form it's less likely to or much less likely to leach through the soil and then there's those environmental impacts. So the next category I had was coated fertilizer. So I'm, I'm talking here about, uh, particularly if you can imagine a, a fertilizer granule that's got a coating around it, and that coating could be a polymer. Um, oh, I guess that, that's the most likely example, uh, a polymer that really delays the release uh, of the nitrogen from that uh, fertilizer granule, uh, often uh, it's just urea granule. Um, but yeah, are there environmental impacts of these as well? I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. But so the, these are the sort of categories of the of the products that are out there, and and where do they fit in with the four R's that we've got? So we've got to fit that product to the situation. Is is it a product that's more useful in a fallow uh, pre-plant application, or is it a product that's more useful for an in-crop situation? So for example, a coated fertilizers most likely going to be used in a pre-plant situation because you want to get it you know, in well ahead of the, the cropping time. You want it to be uh, in the soil but becoming available later on when the crop needs it. So it's you, you, you're sort of um, making, I, I guess, a bit of space around um, when it's when it's coming out and not having to get out there with an available fertiliser for that situation. Whereas an in-crop situation, you might use one of these 
um, products uh, such as the urease inhibitors. So you're, you're doing some in-crop uh, broadcasting, for example, and um, you don't think you'll be able to irrigate, but you're not sure if it's going to rain. So that's that, that's a situation where it, it could fit there. Is the soil wet? I'm supposed to say soil and not soy. Wet soil or dry soil uh, can have an effect as as where you might use this as well. Um, and and the right rate. Well, a, a lot of the benefit of these products can really only be seen if um, you're reducing the rate from um, the rate you would typically use for an unmodified product, because you're expecting uh, a benefit. You're expecting less loss from using this. Therefore, you need less overall fertilizer. Uh, and of course, they cost more, so you want to um, make it uh, work for you. The right timing, so it's pretty crucial, as John said, is the nitrogen going to be available when the crop needs it? Uh, if you if you put it in a, um, say, a coded form and it's only going to be available over the next several months, but you need it right now, then that's not that's not the right fit. And then the right placement, again, sort of comes back to, you know, just really fitting into how you're getting in that product broadcasting a water run that'll obviously help determine which product you need uh, same bit of data as, as as what john had just presented in a slightly different way so so data from uh late 80s actually some very wet autumns like like um like here where they put in this 15n and found uh in in um by the time of planting uh much less of it available in that sense be be, be uh, great to have repeated that this year um so the right products i think we've covered a fair bit of this already so i won't go through that um just a quick bit of data i suppose from a few years ago when uh, we we're doing a uh, some comparisons of a nitrification inhibitor that was applied in conjunction with anhydrous ammonia um, so it was done uh three sites and the focus of this was was actually on um the nitrous oxide emission, so the environmental impact of of uh, applying this crop, and but it's yeah, it's I think relevant to to now as well. So when we were putting in the the pre plant ammonia, um, we had a the inhibitor was injected in the into the the stream and uh, ended up in the soil with the product, uh, both at uh, Gunnedah and Emerald. Uh, did it increase yield? Uh, not in the Gunnedah and Emerald study, um, and this comes back to the point I made just earlier, because the end rates were already very high. So the the savings that we would have made on the um, amount of end being lost were still still left us with with more than the crop needed anyway. So no um, no savings or no increases in cotton yield. Uh, we had a, a study in Mori as well uh, where we varied rates. Uh, but again, we had a fairly nitrogen-rich paddock, as, as it turned out. But uh, another product, it wasn't um, the gas product, but uh, another nitrification inhibitor years before is a calcium carbide product. Um, they did actually find a, a yield difference um, in, that, in that previous study. So oh, this was, oh, here we are. So this is just showing that where we use the product and in the, so the, the rainfall in the top graph, the, the second top graph was the, uh, so they're all sort of, the, the next three graphs are nitri uh, nitrous oxide fluxes, so how much nitrous oxide is coming out. And where we use the um, just straight anhydrous ammonia, you can see this, there's a lot of emission happening in this um, pink graph there. Um, but where we use um, uh, these two different nitrification inhibitor products uh, in the yellow and the green graph below it, there was there's virtually no emissions for that period. And then as the product, uh, as the the inhibitor breaks down, then we start to see a little bit more coming in later in the season as well. So it's certainly very effective those products. Um, and now cutting through to where we use the um, polymer coated products. So we've used some polymer coated urea products. Um, in, in trials at ACRI, we applied them pre-plant. Um, we didn't see any effect on lint yield once again. Uh, adequate nitrogen uh, was the culprit. Um, but we did see a decrease in the measured um, nitrogen in the runoff water in those irrigated paddocks. So instead of 24% of the, 
of the N um, running out of the paddock was down to 7% of the applied N. And at the end of the season, when we saw core, there was more residual N left there. You might be able to see in the red box this, at the end of the season, you could dig it up and still see the little um, uh, capsules there. Uh, we had a separate study where we had buried little bags of these products buried in the soil, uh, in the cotton paddock through the season. There was a one that was, uh, it's, Name was to basically say that most of would be or eighty percent would be released over one eighty days, and and um, the points on the graph show the 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 nitrogen remaining in those uh, in that in those bags over time uh, compared to the green line, which was the the, the company's um, lab test. So it was it's pretty close. Um, you know, we ended up with like one hundred and ninety five days instead of one hundred and eighty, which is pretty close, and ninety one days instead of ninety in this other product and. The 75 day one was a bit different, but that was a sulfur coated one, which there's, there's possibly some issues with doing that in a in a small bag. Um, but yeah, again, everything you always got to consider that what might the environmental impacts be. And we see these polymer spheres still sitting in the ground um, a year later or so. These ones were at the end of um, that season and they still had um, a reasonable amount of nitrogen contained within some of them that we found in the soil. Uh, but yeah, is, it, is this going to be an issue for plastic pollution? How do these break down over time? Are some questions that need to be answered. So to summarise, um, you're not going to get efficiency gains from using these if your N is, is in oversupply. Um, early applied N can be risky, we know, as, as, as um, John showed and, and we showed, same bit of data, but um, yeah. In, in conditions like this year, denitrification is going to be a big factor. Um, Pre-plan N can be can be risky. Um, once you get into the irrigation part of the season, you get uh, early irrigations. We get um, some runoff and some denitrification. And um, yeah, if you've got too much, um, you can get some excessive early growth. Uh, N losses from in crop really depend on the type and irrigation frequency. So yeah, we we had. Uh, trials where we measured some reasonably large losses in in of nitrogen in runoff um, you know, situations but in that case was as where we're water running um, well water running any product basically uh, once you've got water running out the tail end of the of the paddock if if you're still adding the nitrogen to it at the head end then um, you you end up with a net loss we we found actually by stopping the addition of nitrogen to the head channel uh, by the time of um, when it started running out at the other end, uh, we we're actually able to save a lot of nitrogen from runoff, but we still end up with equivalent yield. So that was a, a, a small change that resulted in a win. And um, in volatilization terms, uh, we're, yeah, we're not too keen on the anhydrous ammonia injected into the water because that can relate in some even larger losses. Um, and in terms of inhibitors, slow release products have their place, but you've got to think when's it going to come out? When does your crop really need it? And to really prove that um, they have their place, you need to be reducing a rate, but um, can potentially save from having to uh, apply in crop. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. So over to you now, Chris. Thanks, Warwick. Morning, all. Uh, I'm going to run quickly through um, some sort of pragmatic things and, and some data that I've, uh, I've been uh, provided with just to try and help people work through the process of uh, what to do now. Um, John and Graham have given a great uh, founding on what's been going on in the soils and what the options are. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is, is, I suppose, weave together a process that, um, that I would have used to try and sort out what to do practically in uh, in in the situation that um, a lot of people have uh, found themselves. 
Uh, yeah, it's been a wet season for a lot, and but there's very some very large differences in way the way and when that water's fallen across the industry. So, you know, there's a, a, there's processes we can go through to understand just where you're up to. There's probably been a fair bit of soil testing going on, and people are wondering what's happened to that and how's that changed now. Um, particularly in the in the north and the valleys that have flooded um, since uh, the fertiliser has been applied, and I'll try and address that. So whenever I look at nitrogen and I look at wet conditions and I look at irrigation, um, I look at this triangle and say, well, what's changed? Uh, because this is what's going to change the efficiency of the nitrogen. And if you were talking about changing of efficiency of nitrogen, we're talking about um, losses and rates. Uh, because if the efficiency is lower, we've got to get a higher rate on to get the same availability to the crop. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to grow the crop. Pragmatically, sometimes we've got to make that trade-off, and I think that's a trade-off people make all the time, is uh, I've got to put more on because yield is king. And uh, in most season, that's probably correct when the price and the yield potential is there. But really, I think this season with late planting, um, and some of the soil restrictions we're going to face around the way the soil's been affected by flood water and those sort of things. Realistically, we're going to have to think, rethink what yield potential is really there. So when you look at this, if you look around the outside of the, uh, the triangle, um, water affects nitrogen availability. We've heard if we're too much water, we lose nitrogen from the soil. Uh, water affects soil structure. We know if you put water over un, un, unstable soils, we get um, either compaction um, or consolidation. So compaction being weight on the soil from an external source that causes it to compact. Uh, and that certainly was a feature of uh, wet picks last season. But on top of that, we can end up with a situation called consolidation, which is just excess water on the soil causing it to partially disperse and the weight of the soil compacting it. Um, Graham talked about the influence uh, or the importance of oxygen in the soil. And when we're talking about oxygen, we're talking about an sorry, we're talking about compaction and soil structure. We're talking about an oxygen deficiency in the soil. And it's one we tend to forget about. The other thing that we have is if the soil structure is in decline, then that's going to affect the nitrogen availability as well. Um, and the water and structure combined um, means we've got less oxygen, we've got a higher denitrification potential. So they're the external factors that are affecting each other, but each of those also directly impacts the cotton plant. So, yeah, we know nitrogen does. It has a certain amount of nitrogen uptake we need to have across the season to get a particular yield potential. We need a certain amount of water, but that water, you know, needs to be within a narrow band for the plant to continue to photosynthesize at an optimum rate. You know, we only get to use the water once and we only get to use the light in a season once. Um, so we're trying to optimise all of these things um, to get optimum plant growth and hopefully yield. The third one is soil structure uh, affects the plant as well directly because we know the effect of compaction on root systems. Most things in the plant, as far as nutrients are concerned, happen as a result of, of what's happening to the root system. So, you know, this is the whole thing that we've got to work out. And this is what I want to work through um, as to where are we up to um, and where are we going with nitrogen management. And I put in there early season because depending on what happens in the next 60 to 90 days, um, there will be another point we've got to make some more decisions about what, what, what uh, we're going to do for the rest of the season. But uh, we've got in front of us, um, you know, a, a fair bit to think about just in the next 60 days as to how nitrogen's managed. One of the things that I, you know, we've got, I wanted to understand when I looked at this was what happened to the soil water and what were the mechanisms? Graham and 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 John talked about leaching and denitrification um, and volatilization. I'm not volatilization is related to. Uh, the nitrogen application largely uh, um, of urea. Um, what I want to look at in the in the fallow period up until recently, what happened with soil water over over um, a period from from 
uh, when nitrogen might have been applied um, and soil testing was possibly done to now uh, to try and get an understanding of what mechanisms might have changed that soil test and which direction it would have gone. So what I ran is a, a little program called um, Climate and the, and the How Wet Nitrates section of it. And I ran the data for a period of June to, October, to November 1 for what I set up as a back-to-back -back field, that it had a lower water content coming into um, that period, uh, post-harvest post of the previous crop. And what did that profile look like in total uh, right through till the 1st of November? Uh, and the, 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 the first thing I looked at was runoff and drainage. You know, runoff to me is probably telling you that the 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 profile of the soil is that saturated that water is going to run off, and under those conditions, denitrification and horizontal movement of nitrogen that's been applied in the surface of the soil are going to dominate. So, how you know how much of that was happening versus how much drainage, and drainage to me equates to leaching. This is stuff that's gone below. Um, um, you know, below the, the, the root depth. And you can see relatively in this situation, runoff was more than drainage. So because the water was still filling up the profile, we were getting some movement of nitrogen down, no doubt, but not out the bottom of the profile. Um, but we did have in particular, when you look at these red dots in here, these are the drainage events. And you can see the 20th, 21st of October was a pretty important time as far in back-to-back -back fields because prior to that, denitrification probably wasn't a great factor if the, in back-to-back in -back situations um, because the soil, the soil still had some capacity to take in water and it wasn't saturating for long periods of time and running water. But this, uh, under these conditions, um, with drier soil, there will no doubt be movement downwards of nitrogen. The other circumstance was I, I, I put together what would happen of a fallow field that came out of fallow from last year from wheat and was going through to cotton. And you can see a very different situation where the runoff was um, given the rainfall wasn't that much more, but the drainage was one heck of a lot more. So in, in these back-to-back -back fields, um, sorry, in the, in the fallow fields, um, you know, one of the, the significant things was um, it was quite possibly a, quite a bit of nitrogen moving down out of that fallow stored nitrogen or residual fertilizer nitrogen down the profile. And you can see the number of events across that period would suggest um, that even though, um, you know, we, yeah, we've got a probably a 50, 100 percent increase in the amount of um of runoff events or waterlogging events, um, they were pretty well distributed across the year. And you would say, I, I suppose, where we'd rather have waterlogging if we're going to have it is in, in the middle of winter because it's cold. And we've all, we've had it during the summer and particularly this period. So the effect of that rainfall, um, then this is based on Moree. Um, and if you want to, you know, I'd suggest if you're in somewhere other than Moree, um, that you possibly have a look at this to get a feeling for is my nitrogen deeper in the profile and I haven't lost it or is there some nitrogen that's probably have gone off in, in uh, either denitrification or horizontal movement and and you know and it, you know the rainfall that fell during that period was equivalent to four irrigations end on end um, so you know we know from Graham and, uh, and John's work that um, how much nitrogen can move in that first and second irrigation. So if we fertilised in this period and virtually done four irrigations in this period, uh, there's no doubt nitrogen has moved down the length of the field. And from there, to, who, who knows, probably pump, in some cases um, pumped out back into, into storage or in some cases pumped out into the river to lower the water levels in the paddock quickly. So I've got a case study here based around Moree, um, and the uh, it's around soil testing, fertilising, and when we've retested the, the original soil samples and what we've now know about where the nitrogen went. Um, so the original soil samples were taken uh, between April and June. 
fertilizer was applied between June and October in various fields and, and, and then the soil was resampled on the 17th of October, which uh, in hindsight, we were rushing to beat the, the, um, the rainfall that was coming, but um, really didn't uh, realize that it was about 200 millimeters of rain. So there is a resampling going on of a few of the fields uh, post that to find out what this rainfall did after the resampling on the 17th. So during the period since the fertilizer was applied, uh, up to 190 mils of rain has um, has fallen um, compared to a smaller amount earlier for back-to-back -back fields. Here's some of the fields. These um, th these fields are uh, grey clays, and the um, the original sampling is in June, is in in uh, in blue, and the numbers up here is. Um, this was 138 kilos of nitrogen applied, and I'm not 100% sure which month that was sometime in, in the June to August period. Um, and this number here at the front of the slash is the amount, is the difference in the profile down to 90 centimetres. So we were able to find in this field 101 kilograms of 138 that was applied. Now, I'm not saying that that's all fertiliser. There could be some, some mineralisation in there between June and October. But in, in, in effect, um, you can see the nitrogen increased in the top 30, increased from there to there. So the fertiliser, by and large, between June and October really had not moved that far down the profile in this particular field. And there was some evidence of the fertilizer being still there, but some of the profile nitrogen had, uh, given that the blue lines now retreated in the 30 to 60 backwards, um, and this one's increasing, that there was some depth movement to depth in that particular field. Uh, another one, again, this one had, had uh, we were only able to find half of the nitrogen in the profile that, it, that uh, we should have had by adding together the soil test nitrogen plus the fertilizer nitrogen and by and large most of that was still in the surface on the 17th of october where it is now and this is my guess and i'll, I'll like to uh once we some of these are resampled to see just how accurate uh, i think the, what the effect of that high rainfall um, during that period is probably been mostly in the top 30 centimeters this was saturated anyway so there may have been some small loss of nitrogen down there. But if the soil's uh, saturated with water, it can't push water down any further. So, you know, by and large, it'll either be runoff or denitrification. And I'm, you know, I'm betting it's probably in the, the range 50 to 60 percent, unfortunately, of what was sitting in that top 30 centimetres may now have been lost to those processes. So, you know, these are the types of profiles I'm expecting to come back just based on uh, what's happened at those sites. Some lighter soils in the district, and this one is 183, and the A is the 180 kilograms applied in August. Um, so in June, um, yes, there was a need to apply some air. It was applied in August. You can see the, the benefit to the system, and uh, I'm just unsure why this has increased to that extent down deep. Um, maybe because it is a lighter soil, and we are get a trickling down effect. Um, and in in effect, around a, well over 100 percent of it was still um, still present in that soil on on, on the uh, the Oct October. So may have been some mineralisation that's uh, contributed to it. Um, but you know, overall, given the accuracy of resampling, it's saying in that particular lighter soil type, it appeared to retain most of the nitrogen. Um, this one was one that um, question mark didn't have any nitrogen applied and it appears to have gained a little bit of nitrogen um, from mineralization. So, you know, there's a little bit happened in the surface. Not sure why that's increasing to that extent. Uh, possibly some nitrogen moving down the, the, the profile in this lighter soil. Uh, it's equivalent to about the same amount um, that's moved in the, in the other related soil. Um, and there is some evidence of uh, maybe some deeper drainage on these lighter soils that um, the, we've lost, appear to have lost some at the bottom because the, the, the 60 to 90 layer. Now that may be sampling variability, of, you know, but overall, um, these are the sort of positions we're likely to be, to, to be in 
as far as where is the nitrogen and how much is there. Well, I'll talk a little bit about what that and the meaning of that might be. Another site uh, on a heavier clay soil, um, this one had 300 kilograms applied in, in, in June. Um, and it was showing, um, you know, either some movement down the profile uh, or some loss from the surface or a combination of the both. But uh, by and large, of that, um, that 300 that was applied, we could only find 103 of that. So that would probably tell you in the tops would tell you that probably in these heavier soil types have been quite a bit of a bit of loss. A related one, this one again, quite quite different in that um, we could find 288 of the 300. But this the difference in this one was that it was a different different field, and I don't know which ones were back to back and which which of the fields were um, fallowed. That may account for some of the differences in um, in the nitrogen. Once again, my estimation of what's likely happened in these fields, and the last one the, the same, except these ones were this this one was applied in August. And you can see the nitrogen in, in October hadn't, it's a bit later application. It's still sitting in the top 60 centimetres up until the 17th of June. And this one, we believe, this one was applied in October. And we believe, unfortunately, it was still sitting in the bands and the, 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 the sampling technique that was used totally missed the nitrogen. So nothing had changed. It was still down at the low levels and it wasn't consistent with these ones. So it says when you sample late, um, you know, if you don't get the nitrogen that's been applied in, in, the, in the sample, well, it's not going to show up. And that's, that's really what's happened there. So what are the likely scenarios from soils moderate to high in soil and fertilizer? The losses will probably be from the top 60 centimetres where they were inundated, resulting from denitrification, uh, leaching and, uh, and um, surface runoff. In soils that weren't as inundated, and in, in, in other words, drained fairly quickly, probably some denitrification de de losses and leaching uh, below 30 centimetres. Overall, probably the top 45 centimetres, and this is including my estimation of what's happened with the subsequent rainfall um, if, if, if you're in an area where you had flooding as a result of that late October extra couple of hundred mils. Probably the top 45 centimetres is likely to be fairly low in plant available N uh, at the, at, you know, early in the season. Net mineralisation from the soil as contribution has been minimal contribution to, um, to, to the situation. I think as much as we've mineralised, we've probably lost through those waterlogging events that uh, cause runoff um, events as well. So the management considerations. Um, as John and Graham have pointed out, only 20 or 30 percent or about 60 kilograms of the of the crop's total uptake is required till first flowering. So we're not in a in a big problem yet. Uh, we've still got plenty of time for those that have um, just planted. Um, and we've probably got at least a 30 to, to 45 day window to remedy this. So possibly the soil only needs a combination, um, you know, of 100, uh, uh, 120 kilograms of soil nitrogen plus fertilizer in the top 30 to 45 centimeters um, to get us through to um, to the period when um, when we're really starting to get on on uh, on a, a short leash to get things going. The remainder of the nitrogen, majority of the nitrogen application needs to happen from squaring through to four to six weeks after uh, after first flowers. That's the period when we've got 70 to 80 percent of the, the crop nitrogen in the crop. And that's the one that, that really is going to be critical in managing nitrogen. We would rather get ahead of it. In other words, get a decent dose on so we're not going into that um, first flowers with uh, the plant starving for nitrogen because we know once it hits that and we have a hiccup, it is very, very difficult to catch up and stop it from wanting to cut out if growth conditions are, um, are good in early January. So, you know, really it's about trying to do what we can do, um, getting close to squaring, get a decent amount on, um, and then, tr and then um, 
and then try and get it on as as uh, as 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 much as we can um, in the four to six weeks after first flowers. The other thing that comes up that needs to be spoken about, and uh, John did and Graham did touch on this, is we're going to have to be careful of late season consequ consequences of nitrogen bulge at sixty to ninety. Depending on the, you know, that that soil down uh, down that layer is saturated, and unless we get a drying time prior to um, cut out, sometime we get a, the ability for the plant to suck that up because we, our, our irrigation schedule allows us to do that to dry the soil to, to 80 or 90 centimetres. We're going to be faced with a potential for very high figure during uh, cutout if nitrogen has slipped down into that 60 to 90 layer. So what are the options for confirming the nitrogen status in the season? I think there is still an opportunity on a window to do some deep soil tests if it is at all logistically practical. We're, as I said, we're only up to about 20% uptake till, uh, till, uh, till squaring and there is time uh, and then you know, we're talking about 40 to 50 days to actually get some samples to the lab and understand where the nitrogen is and then make a, a judgment based on, you know, when we've got to apply it, what uh, is likely to happen if we've got to discount it for what's in the crop and uh, and just go about doing a nitrogen budget and seeing where we're up to for the realistic yield potential that we uh, that we've um, that we've set up. The other one is to use the plant to actually do some uh, the testing for us, either using leaves or petioles. Both of these, um, I know they're looked at suspiciously, but there are practitioners out there that are using these very effectively in guiding in crop um, decisions. And there is reasonable data around what are the critical points and how to sample them. So, you know, they are technologies a lot of people shy away from. But this season, if you don't know where your nitrogen is, it may be the, the season to start using these to understand how the crop is progressing and how we should manage nitrogen. And it's really about listening to the crop because the crop will tell us what's going on. It's, it's integrating daily. What's the water looking like? What's the light looking like? What's the temperature doing? How much nitrogen do I need to grow? So it's got the accumulated plant response. Um, it uses the root system to do the sampling, which is probably the right thing to do. It's telling you about, about what's going on. Uh, and it frequently is quicker to um, to tell you about what the nutrient status of the plant is than just just measuring the soil. A little bit about sampling. When you're sampling, you've just got to be cognizant of where the roots are growing relative to where you expect the, the nutrient to be. There are times that it's not right to sample too early if we're looking for not nutrients deeper in the sample in, in the profile. No use sampling a, a plant for a nutrient that's down the profile if it, the roots haven't reached there yet. So, you know, th there's times to sample and there's times not to sample, and it's really about what's the purpose. And if it's to sample a, nu a nutrient that's right in the surface, fine, you can start early. But if it's to sample a bulge, uh, the plant and how it's going when it gets to a bulge, we're going to wait till it actually grows roots down there before we sample. And that's one of the, the main principles when we're talking about sampling. Uh, oh, look, I pinched these from uh, a couple of our customers that um, that, that are into um, plant sampling and and, uh, and and provide plant sampling um, interpretation. Um, and you know, really, we do have some good understanding uh, of just the way the plant. This is for petioles uh, in the north uh, last season, and it just shows that the, the nice zone to have them within. Here's some that were running hot. Um, and here's some that were running short towards, um, you know, a, a critical window. It does give you a feel for where those those things are. And, you know, even more so, um, my concern is once we get out here and we've got plants like that, we've got too much vigour for cutout and we're going to have quality problems. So PDLs and, and plant samples are not just about increasing yield. They're about making sure we get quality yield at the end of the season if we've got and guiding us into a situation where we've got yield, but we don't have bigger problems at the end of the season that are going to cause issues with quality. And even more so, um, the guys at Summit down the Riverina, um, a couple of season information. And, you know, I would have concern running you know, numbers this high late in the season. Now, if we go back and quickly look at 
some of the nitrogens down the profile here. Um, this one's got 100, and kil 100 kilograms at 60 to 90. Um, this one's got 50, which is not all that high. Uh, this one's got 150. Um, there is uh, evidence that last season, that either through late season application or leaching last season because it was a wet season, um, there is nitrogen at depth and that is a, poses a problem for this year. So Warwick, um, that's my message. Uh, happy to um, open it up for any, any um, discussion or, um, or questions. Thanks, Chris. If nitrogen was applied in August, September and there's been rainfall since, are there uh, particular uh, parts of the paddock that uh, you would focus on for doing soil tests? And relating to that a little bit, if people know that there are um, low spots and waterlogged spots within a field, um, is it worthwhile sampling those waterlogged spots and comparing them to the, um, the less waterlogged spots to see whether they get managed differently? In, in any field, there is always a gradation of nitrogen after application through um, when you've had rainfall and you've applied fertiliser, even even just mineralised nitrogen down the field. Um, you know, John described that there is a movement from head ditch to tail drain. Uh, any nitrogen, particularly that that's that's uh, in in the beds or at, at a high level in the profile or above the above the furrow. And, and to some extent, just slightly below the furrow. If it was placed at 60 centimetres, probably not. But um, those shallower applications, uh, yes, you will generally have less at the top and um, more at the bottom. Um, and um, it can be quite significant. Um, I have measured uh, at the end of a season 60 to 80 kilograms difference between a head ditch and a tail drain, uh, just in residual soil nitrogen. So it can, and so you know that might be a you know a strategy to make sure you do some head ditch tail drain. It's not just doing one in the paddock; it's doing um, the head ditch and the tail drain to get an understanding, and possibly just group your paddocks according to their slope and their soil type, and saying that's the order of magnitude of difference I'm going to be facing when I put the crop in the ground. Um, and then the question is, then how do you handle that as far as nitrogen application? Um, you know, it becomes a you know a um, a zonal management if that's possible. Yeah. The other one with waterlogging, it depends on the proportion of the paddock. Like pragmatically, um, you know, if the majority of the paddock is represented by the waterlogging area, then you want to go and look at the worst case scenario. Um, again, you could do comparative sampling, but I, if it was me and, and, and the waterlogging was the majority of the paddock, then I would be looking at doing that. And um, and. And, uh, and 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 guiding my, uh, my 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 nitrogen rate and strategy around the, what's what the, what's the worst I'm looking at, uh, and maybe taking a pragmatic um, approach and just saying, well, the other stuff's going to be better. Do I really need to change? Or if you you remind um, sampling both. Yep. Um, we've got a question here from Daniel, which might be to you, Graham, around um, do urease inhibitors work the same on UAM? Um, and does UAM behave differently to urea uh, when streamed on soil on the soil surface? Uh, so UAN, it's, um, well, it's one one component of it is urea. So that component is going to behave as the urea does. So when it's when it's applied, it's going to um, hydrolyze and create that high uh, pH environment that uh, can potentially lead to, to losses by volatilization. Um, I guess what you've got as a difference to, say, broadcasting urea is that it's uh, already dissolved and if you're streaming it on, it's you're getting that directly into contact with the soil uh, as opposed to having it sit on top of the soil and you know, just dissolving with, um, with humidity or dew, that sort of thing. So where it doesn't sort of move into the soil, but stays at the top. So it's all about getting um, contact with the soil and contact with the greatest volume of soil. So if if things are applied in a very concentrated form and there's not much protection there, then that's your situation where there's more likelihood of, of loss, where as opposed to something that's um, 
more diffuse and got greater access to, to a greater volume of soil. So um, I think that's probably where, or, or does the urease inhibitor work with that? So yes, it would. Um, it, it would work with the urea part of it. Uh, and it would keep that in the urea form uh, for a while. It's not something that I've tested directly, but um, uh, it's you know, has been done in the literature. So um, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm hesitant to say it depends, but you know, soil type is a factor <laughs> as as to how its um, how its effects are. Yeah. Graham, the other comment I'd make, if I can. Uh, UAN is it's got a pH of 6.5 generally, uh, which does buffer the soil if you put it on the concentration to buffer that that, that rise in pH that, that, that flows into uh, volatilization. So it's generally less volatile by itself by adding a urease inhibitor would make it even more so. But you know, the the, the, the relative gain, only 50% of the nitrogen in UAN is urea. Mm -hmm. And just following on from that uh, a question that we received before um, the webinar was just around if a greater proportion is of nitrogen has been applied in crop, um, should uh, we be avoiding uh, spreading urea on soil surface, um, given the the season that we've uh, liked it to have, or not. Uh, well, in, in any season, if you're spreading urea on the surface and it's not followed up with the potential to get it, you know, from the surface into the soil, then your your potential for uh, volatilisation. Uh, loss is there. Um, I should qualify it by saying that you know volatilization's got you're not going to lose it all. Um, in you know your worst case scenario might be um, say losing a third uh, of of what's put on. That's a worst case. Um, but if in a sort of more normal situation, if you if you're putting your uh, you're broadcasting your urea on and it's followed up with an irrigation within sort of one to two days after that losses are minimal like hard, hardly any like you know, a, a couple of percent let's say at the most um, so it's it's you've got like i say that one to two day window after applying it um, if you're applying it and you're not able to follow it up with an irrigation then if that surface that you apply it to is relatively dry then you've probably got a bit more time than if it's a wet surface so if it's a wet surface and you're putting it on um, that'll dissolve straight away and the you know, your hydrolysis process can kick off yeah. um, earlier than if you apply it and then it's sort of waiting for some moisture to come along and dissolve it and, and wash it into the soil yep um uh, time's getting away but i'll try and slip in two more quick questions uh, one from James here about in cool seasons, are we underestimating the amount of end mineralization? And all, also, are we underestimating nitrogen use efficiency in cooler seasons? So, any comment about the tension between those two um, differences in cool seasons? I'm asking you, John. I guess I can start there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, microbial activity is definitely affected by its soil temperature, but I think from what we saw for, from Chris and the and the soil data, there was pretty high mineralisation occurring during the winter months and even early spring. Um, so there was a, a reasonable good amount of mineralisation occurring. In terms of nitrogen use efficiency, um, it, it really depends. It, you know, that's fertiliser use. It depends what index you want to evaluate, but if it's fertiliser use, um, then that goes off your, your application and your yield or productivity. Um, another index that I like to use a lot is the system um, nitrogen use efficiency, and that does take into account your, your soil nitrogen. So um, if, if you can use your soil nitrogen along with fertiliser application and then evaluate that against productivity, um, that that's a really good index to to highlight, I guess, the potential for mineralisation within your own system. So, 
Um, it's a little bit more of a holistic index. Um, it's probably not always, it's not the easiest one to describe because you, you, you need soil data to perform that index. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is a far better index if you, you're trying to evaluate the potential for your own cropping system. Okay. And I want to finish off with you, Chris. There's been a few questions around with poor preparation and compaction from last season. Um, are we should we be assuming that root development is going to be less, and should we be managing uh, with the assumption of a shallower uh, root zone, um, or can we test or check that through the season to see whether that's a factor? Uh, that's going to be. To me, it, it's going to be once we start, well, we, we, the, the key to what the roots are doing and the way they're extracting water uh, is your probe data. It'll tell you what's go, what's going on. Um, it'd be nice to have probes in the row and between the row to know when it starts to use water where from. Um, but, you know, if you see that we're not getting extraction, uh, if we, if, you know, if we ever get a, wet, uh, a a dry time, that we actually get roots going down below thirty centimeters, um, it'll be important to watch how quickly it's able to dry it out, to see whether the roots are working effectively. You know that that first irrigation, as John's research has, has indicated, as to whether we run a 40 mil deficit or we run a 70 mil deficit, really in those first couple of irrigations is going to tell us what's going to happen for the rest of the season. So if we don't get the chance to get the root systems down to sort of a, a, a 70 mil deficit in the in the um, in uh, pre-flowering, then we've got some challenges, some big challenges um, to manage the rest of the season because I will no, no doubt that the root system will be set up to work in the top 45 centimetres of the soil um, and that's going to make every decision around nitrogen application and water management um, very critical um, every, every time we do it because we don't want to stress the plant but we don't want to overwater it. Um, and we've got to just understand where is the nitrogen in the profile because I have a big concern um, around um, what's down at 60 to 90. We get a dry, a reasonably orderly picking um, and if we dry the plant down to 80 centimetres, um, that, that end of season could be uh, a big factor if yep. there's nitrogen deeper in the profile. Okay, um, time-wise there, I'm going to pull it up, but I want to thank uh, the participants for the questions that you've sent through um, and just encourage you if there are more questions or as the season unfolds, um, take advantage of uh, the access to um, the expertise within the industry through um, REOs um, or John as the technical lead uh, in Cotton Info and uh, we'll do what we can to be able to respond to that and uh, provide information. Um, I want to thank uh, Chris and Graham and John for uh, their input today, and um, which has been a response to um, demand and interest uh, to be able to run this. Um, just flagging that we've got the um, nitrogen um, Field days coming up where there will be the opportunity for more face-to-face -face, uh, discussion and a bit bit longer time. Um, so take advantage of those uh, if they're near uh, where you are. But um, I might pull it up there and uh, thanks for your participation and um, yeah, hopefully a few sunny days are coming along soon. <laughs>